Hi, it's Robin. I've got here an issue of Zap64 from August 1987, and I bought this when I lived in Australia. This is the first issue of Zap I ever had. Growing up in Canada, I had never heard of Zap. In 1987, I lived in Australia for one year, and more than halfway through the year, I finally found out about this magazine, discovered it, saw it at Claremont News, and bought it there. And what a first issue to have Defender of the Crown, Last Ninja, Head Over Heels, all reviewed in the same issue. This was fantastic. So by now, I think probably even most of my North American viewers will have heard of Zap. But back in the day, this was virtually unknown in North America, despite being so popular in the UK where it was published. And uh, obviously in Australia, they imported it. So Zap was mostly famous for its game reviews. Here's where the game Head Over Heels got the very rare gold medal award. But they also had interesting features such as this Game Developer's Diary by Andrew Braybrook. And this section called Gary Lydon's Technical Bit in the Middle. There's a very flattering picture of him. And this is what I want to focus on today. Transporting sprites across the border. This is a letter that was written in to Gary. Dear Gary, on lots of recent games I've noticed there seem to be sprites where the border should be. I program in machine code a bit and code lots of different effects, but I can't see any way of achieving this at all. Is it some secret Vic chip feature that Commodore never revealed, or is it a strange bug? I've tried all sorts of things, but I can't seem to get to happen. Since I'm not on CompuNet and don't have any programming pals or coding chums, there's nobody I can ask. Do you know how to do it? Gaz Smith. And Gary replies, what a popular question that is. Type this in. And he's got a program listing here. So, as we do, I'm going to type this in. My patron Sheila suggested that I get myself a copy holder for next time I do a type in. And so that's what I've done. I couldn't find a vintage one that did exactly what I wanted, so I bought this modern 3M, and it fortunately sits just above where my micro IEC and super snapshot are. It can sit right behind the Commodore, but I found that really hard to get on camera. I'm going to try it here. I don't know. It might need some experimenting. So I'll type this in. It shouldn't take me long. Just jump ahead to the next chapter in the timeline if you don't want to see this. 10, F equals 491522, read A, 30. If F equals 255, then print that pressed your hat, sys 491522, and, ooh, stop. Some programmers like to use stop instead of N. Poke F comma A, so it's just a standard loader like we've seen lots of times before. Go to 20, 70, 80, and here we go, some data statements. These are actually the machine language opcodes in decimal form. If I make any mistakes, then uh, shout really loud. Data eight nine six one sixty nine one one forty one. Oop. <laughs> one forty one twenty five two eight two thirty eight one thirty data three two two eight three seventeen two oh eight forty one two forty seven one forty one one forty data seventeen two oh eight seventy three eighteen two oh eight 208, 251, 173, 150, 17, 208, 41, 127, 9, 8, 141, 17, 160, data 208, 206, 32, 208, 76, 49, 234, 
255. That's unusual using a sentinel value of 255. A value outside of an 8-bit value could be used just as easily. Okay, I'm going to play this risky. I'm not going to save it. Run. Oh, illegal quantity error in 40. Poke F comma A. Okay, so print F comma A. Oh, <laughs> you guys didn't shout loud enough. Okay, line 114. I missed a comma there. Let's try this again. Run. Out of data error in 20. Read A. So it's not... Hey, why does this say if F? It's reading in, reading in the value into A, but then it's comparing F. So, yeah, that's not my typo. That's a mistake in the program listing. Okay, so that should be A. I did. I haven't typed this in since 1987, so I don't remember that. Run. Let's try it again. That pressed your hat. Woohoo! There we go. The borders are gone. Okay, so if you see what's happening here, normally, you know, the blue extends right across the screen. So there is a gray stripe down there now that presumably is being done by a raster interrupt. And it's also preventing the bottom and the top border from being drawn. So now there's just like side borders as stripes down the sides. So this is a pretty neat hardware trick and fairly easy to implement. Now, before we look at the machine code, I'll just go show you a couple things here. If you poke 16383, that's normally inconsequential memory. Like, it, well, it's, it's part of basic RAM where you would store your basic program if it got long enough or if you had enough variables using up that space. But a lot of the time it just sits there unused. But if I poke now, like 255, see how now the bottom border has reappeared in black. Well, you might guess what's going on here, but here, I'm going to poke 129 in. Watch what happens to that bottom border. It turns into stripes. Or if I just store one in there, it turns into skinnier stripes. What's actually happening is whatever this byte is, is repeated over and over again in the border area. And so if there's a zero in memory, it's blank. But if you put one in, it's just treated like character graphics, like bitmap graphics. It's just repeated that one byte over and over again. So it forms a pattern. It's always going to be uh, vertical stripes. Or if we turn on all the bits, like 15 turns on the lower nibble, and now will be fat bars that are four pixels wide each. So that's kind of like a quirk of the VIC chip, is for whatever reason, it's reading the last byte in the memory bank. Normally, when you turn on the C64, the VIC looks at the first memory bank, which is the first 16K of RAM. And you can set it to look at the any of the four blocks of 16K of RAM. That's how much the VIC can see at a time, is 16K. It has 14 address lines. 14 bits allows it to address up to 16K. And normally you wouldn't see that when the borders have been opened or killed, as sometimes seniors call it, then you get to see behind the scenes that the VIC-2 is just fetching that last byte over and over again and displaying it behind the border. So that's basically that's all that can be shown in the bottom border, except if we do something like, I'm going to set V equal to 53248. I'm going to turn on the first sprite. I'm going to put the sprite on screen at location. Oh, there, sorry. <laughs> Can I ruin the surprise there? That's just full of garbage. Um, 2040 is the sprite pointer. Point it to sprite 13. 
which is at 13 times 6 for location 832, for x equals 832 to 832 plus 63, poke x comma 50 to 55, next. Okay, so we've just made a square sprite, and now we're going to move it down the screen, v plus 1 to location 200, to 10, to 20, right? And normally to 30. Now normally the sprite would be hidden behind the bottom border, but as you can see, we can move it right down to 55, and it's still visible to me on my monitor. I hope you can still see it there. And actually, if we go to location zero, we're just changing the Y position. See how it just moves down one more. So actually, sprite locations zero, one are visible down there at the bottom of the screen. Okay, there, now it's finally off the screen. And if we move to line 20, uh, I can't see that yet on my monitor, I don't know if it might be visible to you guys. I'll go to line 30. Okay, there it is, starting to show up again. You see it's up above where the cursor is. Okay, and this is actually being used in lots of Commerce 64 games, although on NTSC, because our top and bottom borders are so much smaller, it's actually not as useful to us. Uh, PAL has a lot more top and bottom border space, so games utilize this trick to put sprites in the borders, often to display the score uh, and those kind of heads up kind of displays. And that's how they did it. They would kill the border, then put the sprites down in the border out of the way of the gameplay, effectively making the usable screen uh, larger than the 200 pixels. And uh, yeah, some of them used a lot. Now on NTSC, that's a problem. Some of those games from PAL would come here to NTSC land and you couldn't see that bottom area very well. And so your score might be cut off and so on. I think Whizball is an example of that. Okay, so how does this work? Let's pop into the monitor. Okay, so that machine language was put in memory at C000. There it is, just this section here. So let's disassemble that and see if we can figure out what's going on. Okay, so it starts off with the classic set interrupt disable, which is usually a clear sign that we're going to change the interrupts. This is the kernel interrupt vector at 0314 and 0315. And this is the vector you use if you want it to play nice with Commodore Basic, or at least with the kernel operating system. And we're redirecting it to the low byte, high byte of C022, which is right down here. This is the actual new interrupt routine. And you can see it's right after a return statement. So this is typically a new block of code. So this all looks pretty standard here. And here we're going to set where the raster interrupt is going to take place at raster line F9, which is way down near the bottom of the screen. So I think we'll look at that a bit more later, but that's one of the tricks to making this border open. And also storing F9 in DCOE. Well, that's a bit weird. So it's kind of strange that they stored F9 in there. This is, okay, so DCOE is a control register for the CIA chip. So F9 means all these bits, 4 through 7, are set. And the 9 means we're going to start timer A. And timer A run mode is one shot instead of continuous. Okay, well, this seems a bit suspicious, but basically I think it means that the CIA interrupt that normally drives the system, the kernel routine, 
is only going to run one more time and then it'll quit. I don't know why they didn't just stop it or... Anyway, that, that's a bit strange. But apparently it works. So I expect that was done just to save a couple bytes rather than loading a more sensible value and storing it in DCOE. It does the job even if it's not doing it quite as, as <laughs> properly or as maybe it should. Okay, and then these next two are setting up the raster interrupt and also acknowledging it. So you put one in DO19 that enables raster interrupts, and those are going to drive this routine. And the DO1A is just to acknowledge it. I don't really think that's necessary here either. Maybe it is. And then we're going to load value 1B and store that in DO11. And 1B is just the same as 27 decimal, which I've noted down here is just the default value for this register. This is a very busy register, but the important part here is that bit 3 selects a 24 or 25 row text display. And that's the secret to how this works. We'll see it in a moment. We're ensuring that the 25 row text display is enabled right now. Okay, then we'll just re-enable, clear, interrupt, disable, and return from the subroutine. And now the interrupt is set up. And this code here at C022 is now going to start executing 60 times a second while on NTSC or 50 times a second on PAL. And here's the rest of the routine. Every time the interrupt runs, we're going to again load value one and store it in DO19. That just acknowledges the raster interrupt. So the VIC chip knows that the programmer has dealt with that raster interrupt and it's free to set it again next frame or actually whenever it happens. And then we're incrementing the border color. This isn't necessary. That's just that gray bar that you saw at the bottom of the screen. I've shown that before in other videos. It's commonly just a way of showing that your code is running and how long the code is taken. The size of that bar indicates how long your code is taking to execute by the amount of raster time it's taking. As the screen is drawn from top to bottom 50, 60 times a second, every scan line represents 63 or 65 cycles, machine cycles, on the computer. And then we load in D011, which we were just talking about here, and it with F7. So that value of F7 means all bits except bit 3 are kept. Bit 3 is set to 0, which means 24 rows. And this is the secret of removing the borders. Setting the border from 25 rows to 24 rows at the right moment prevents the VIC from flipping the border on. The VIC2 chip misses its chance to flag drawing the border and never does for that whole frame. I'll explain that a little bit more when we get back to basic. Okay, and once that bit is set to zero, we just store it back in. Then we load in the DO12, which is the current raster position and we wait until it equals zero. This is just a busy loop waiting until the raster count goes to zero, which means it's at the bottom of the screen. The ninth bit has been set. It's actually at least 262 up to 312 lines, depending on VIC model. So there's always a ninth bit involved. So since we know the raster interrupt happened at raster line F9, we know we're approaching raster line FF hacks, so we just wait some more cycles in this busy loop until the raster line equals zero. Then we again load the current value of DO11, which is that register full of bits, including the screen height 24 or 25 rows. We end it with 7F. What this does is make sure that the high bit is zero because that's actually the ninth bit of the raster interrupt. And if it's accidentally set to one, that means your next raster interrupt 
will try to happen at raster line, say, 500, give or take, uh, 502, I think. <laughs> and that doesn't exist, and it'll never happen. Your, your code will freeze. So we're making sure that the raster interrupt happens on the first page. That was actually in my Bruce Lee episode. I believe that was the cause of the occasional crashes because they didn't take the time to clear this bit here. And then we OR it with 8, which is bit 3, which again switches us back to the normal 25 row mode of the VIC display so that we're good for the next frame. And then that gets stored in DO11. Then we decrement the border color, which again isn't necessary, but we're doing it. But it's just, I guess, for display or diagnostic. And then jump EA31, that's the regular kernel handler. So we jump through and allow the C64 to still read the keyboard, flash the cursor, and all that. Okay, so that's the whole routine. That's all the code. But I think I should explain this a little bit more. If you see right now, I got the cursor in the bottom corner. And uh, I'll just write some letters down there. Now, if I poke 53265, that's the same as that DO11 we've been talking about. If I poke 27 in there, nothing should change. We're in 25 column mode. If I subtract 8 from that, that is the same as disabling or zeroing bit 3. And this will change our screen display to 24 columns. So watch the bottom and top's border should shrink. There, you see that? Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, there's an X up here. So you can see half of that's missing. Half the cursor is under the border now. And same with down here. Half of that bottom row is also under the border now. Commodore included this feature for smooth scrolling so that when the screen was shifting up or down smoothly, some of the garbage from the screen scrolling could be hidden under the borders, or actually all of that. So that's what that feature is for. But this is also the trick that allows you to open the border. So normally, when we have the borders open, you can just imagine the raster is drawing the screen from top to bottom. 60 times a second, it's shooting down the screen, again, on NTSC 50 on PAL. The raster draws down, and there's some very simple logic that once the raster reaches a certain point on the screen, just below the cursor here, the border is turned on. We don't have direct control over the border, but the VIC-2 has an internal bit that we can't directly affect. But internally, it sees, oh, I'm at the bottom of the screen. I need to turn on the border. Now that would normally be nice and simple, but because of this border shrinking feature, the VIC has some extra logic where it checks if the borders are shrunk, like they are right now, then it has to start drawing the borders a little bit earlier, for scan lines earlier. So the trick is, just going to do zero there. <laughs> so the trick is to wait until the raster gets in that section the last four scan lines before the border happens. So now we're down right down here in the down the bottom legs of the A there. That's where the raster is drawing. The tester reaching the bottom of the screen is not true. And then what happens is in that raster interrupt, we at the right moment bring the border up above it, well then the check has moved beyond where the raster already is, so it still isn't true. Hope I can explain this well enough. <laughs> anyway, it just misses the check. And then over and over again, you just keep dodging that by switching that bit on and off. You keep avoiding having the current raster line meet the needed raster line to enable the borders, and so they just aren't drawn. And there you go. So you might be curious about the side borders. Is it possible to disable them? It is, but I'm not going to get into that today because it is way harder to open the side borders 
than the top and bottom borders. While I say harder, it's exactly the same technique where you just shrink in the left-right borders and then pop them out again at the right moment. But the vertical borders give you lots of wiggle room. You can have very imprecise timing and still manage it. On the horizontal borders, you have to be cycle exact and you have to do it every single scan line. You don't have to do it just once per frame like the like the top and bottom borders, but every scan line over and over again, you have to do that trick to open up the side borders. And it's further complicated in that if you are trying to put sprites in there, it further affects the timing because of the way the Vic works. It uses cycles. The more sprites you have enabled, the more cycles are stolen from the CPU. So it makes the timing even trickier. So you'll just have to take my word. That, that is how it works, but the side borders are way harder. I have done that before, but it's been many years and I would have to, that, that would definitely be its own episode. So that was fun. I remember typing that in back in 1987. And at that time, I had no idea how this worked. And since then, I've learned about, but I've never gone back and actually examined their code. So <laughs> how often do these type-in programs have mistakes? Never mind that we make, but that even the original publishers made. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my patrons for their support, for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.